All right, so welcome everyone to this teaching, um, which will be held in English by Lisa and Evan. Um, I will just start by saying something about the organization Platypus. So the Platypus Affiliate Society was established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 20 to 30s, new 60s to 70s, and political 80s to 90s left um, for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. If you'd like to find out more about Platypus, you can go to our website, platypus1917.org. We have a regular podcast, Shit Platypus Says, which is on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. We publish monthly the Platypus Review, which is an open submission, submission journal. So if you like to publish something, get in touch with us. Um, the Leipzig chapter runs a reading group Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and occasionally coffee breaks currently on Zoom to, to the coronavirus. Uh, you can find more information about our activities and other Platypus chapter activities on platypus1917.org slash virtual or just get in touch with us today so we can add your email to our email list where you then will be informed about our local activities here in Leipzig regularly. Um, we will be recording this event. Um, you can ask questions in German as well as in English after the presentation via the chat or by just unmuting yourself. Um, and also we will be having another teaching on the critique of political economy today via Zoom at 3 p.m. and two more teachings on the topic of Bonapartism and reform revolution resistance on Wednesday. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So I'll just hand over to you guys. Um, one second, there's people that want to enter. Okay, but how do I get people in here? Frankly, in the... Okay, got it. Um, all right. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'll begin. The recent protests against police brutality have raised questions about the revolutionary character of the United States. What was the promise of the American Revolution? And from that standpoint, what did Marx mean when he wrote, from the commencement of the titanic American strife, the working men of Europe felt instinctively that the star-spangled banner carried the destiny of their class in a letter to Abraham Lincoln. How has the left responded to 1776 and following events in the past, and how has their stance changed over time? For much of the left, both inside and outside the United States, the American Revolution is portrayed as a conservative event, a defense of slavery, a refusal by the rich and powerful of the colonies to pay for wars they previously agitated for. The left's condemnations of imperialism, of neoliberalism, and of racism have led it to dismiss out of hand the idea that America and the American Revolution could be both a great step in the unfolding of human freedom and still provide positive lessons for anyone interested in emancipatory politics today. This view is particularly pervasive outside of the United States, but is also present on the American left. To dismiss the American Revolution as conservative is at best willful blindness. The American Revolution was an earth-shattering event that challenged and even smashed the old order. The long and winding road to the Finland station passed through Lexington and Concord. That the dream of the American Revolution was not fully achieved is no reason to not take it seriously. That the American Revolution today is only upheld by the right is no excuse for ignoring its revolutionary character. It deserves far, it deserves far better defenders than Fox News. To quote the American historian Gordon S. Woods from his book, The Radicalism of the American Revolution, if we measure the radicalism of revolutions by the degree of social misery or economic deprivation suffered, or by the number of people killed or manor houses burned, then this conventional emphasis on the conservative conservatism of the American Revolution becomes true enough. But if we measure the radicalism by the amount of social change that actually took place, by transformations in the relationships that bound people to each other, then the American Revolution was not conservative at all. On the contrary, it was as radical and as revolutionary as any in history. The American Revolution was not a conflict between colonists and America and the British government. It was a truly global event. 
it was a civil war within the British Empire with outside interventions on both sides of the conflict. It was the culmination of a century of Enlightenment thought, an attempt to bring the liberal ideas of the Enlightenment into reality through a democratic republic. The American Revolution did not only inspire the French Revolution that followed on its heels, and in fact, some of the same people were involved in both the French and American revolutions, but it also inspired the first international and the Bolsheviks amongst countless others. In the 21st century, it seems that only the right upholds the American Revolution, while much the left dismisses it as a slaveholder's revolt, as white supremacy, or as settler colonialism. This is to do a grave disservice, not simply to the American Revolution, but to the very ideas of revolutionary politics, of emancipatory politics, and of freedom. So, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I will say something um, about the rise of bourgeois society. So the modern era is an era of revolution, which means the overthrow of traditional civilization, which has been characterized by the most far reaching social transformation the world hasn't seen before. The revolution of the people is the fundamental transformation of their social relation through an increasing exchange of free labor. In respect to that, humanity created their second nature, society. That is more than the sum of its parts. Free cooperation and the spirit of commerce, as Kant put it, ought to replace increasingly war, despotism, and slavery. It is, an increasing, it is an era of increasing mobility. People were not determined by the place that they were born, their family or a certain nationality. They moved to find new work all over the world. The rising cosmopolitan bourgeois society formed a new culture of debate, free trade and a global division of labor. That all generated the thought of enlightenment. It is the universal idea that human possibilities are multiple and infinite, only determined by society itself that make the world moving forward instead of merely around. History as such was first formulated as the universal history of self-transformation and as the self-consciousness of freedom. It was the death blow of feudalism. The late discovery of North America was the biggest outward movement of the further developed bourgeois world and ought to mark a fresh start in history of a free laboring population that spread trade and commerce and deepens the division of labor. This new society of free cooperation felt no longer represented by the government that limited their social transformation and idea of freedom. So the common slogan, no taxation without representation and war of independence was merely a final consequence of a revolution for society, the political revolution that took place all over the world. American revolutionaries like Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine took part in the French Revolution and Jefferson himself was a big supporter of the Jacobins. Thomas Paine wrote, in his common sense, quote, the cause of all of America is in a great measure the cause of all mankind. Many circumstances have and will arise which are not local but universal and through which the principles of all lovers of mankind are affected and in the event of which their affections are interested. From the pen of the great Thomas Jefferson, the, form, the Lockean formula, the rights to life, liberty, and property of ourselves and others from 1689 was further developed with a certain misery and genius. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal is a valuation of the equality of all human beings formulated as a task that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, the valuation of individuality and the pursuit of happiness, the formulation of the open opportunity of every individual to fulfill its potential in society. 
These were the promises of the American Revolution. That's what society ought to be, formulated as its task. The struggle of independence started with the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and found its accomplishment in the Bill of Rights in 1789 that aims to secure these unalienable rights, for example, through the freedom of speech, the right to keep and bear arms, which is the right of self-defense and the innocence till proven guilty. It's the formulation of an idea of a free cooperating society that takes responsibility for itself. That does also mean that the state is legitimized as a function of a facilitator for society to promote these unalienable rights and the transformation of society towards freedom. Society has the right to bear arms and the duty to defend themselves against illegitimate governments and despotism. But as Benjamin Rush put it, the American war is over, but this is far from being the case with the American revolution. On the contrary, nothing but the first act of the great drama is closed. It remains yet to establish and perfect our new forms of government and to prepare the principles, morals and manners of our citizens. From these forms of government, after they are established and brought to perfection, Freedom itself has to be understood as a process of becoming instead of a state of being. During the late 18th century, the American population grew four times faster than Europe's and six times faster than world average. In 1803, Jefferson doubled the territory of the US, not through war, but acquisition of the Louisiana Purchase, what he called Empire for Liberty of, from France. First of all, to help Napoleon promote the Code Civil in Europe and to absorb the immense population growth. The transport revolution after 1815 was essential for the union to grow together. This caused an intense division of labor. The process of industrialization made society less rural or agrarian and more urban. The highest urbanization rate was from 1810 to 1860. Since labor power was scarce, the new machines increased workers' productivity rapidly. People shared for industrial progress because they foresaw the shift that machines ought to be used for the greater implementation of free time. As Pam Nogales put it in her lecture on the legacy of the American Revolution, later the reform of the 10 hours working day was celebrated as an expression of the pursuit of happiness. But at the same time, workers went on strikes and organized themselves in working men's parties. But falling wages, bad working conditions and replacement of high skilled workers by new technology were not the main cause of workers outrages. As James McPherson put it, quote, it was not so much the level of wages as the very concept of wages itself that fueled much of this protest. Wage labor was a form of dependency that seems to contradict the Republican principles on which this country had been founded. The core of Republicanism was liberty, a precious but precarious birthright constantly threatened by corrupt manipulations of power. The philosopher of republicanism, Thomas Jefferson, had defined the essence of liberty as independence, which required the ownership of productive property. A man dependent on others for a living could never be truly free, nor could a dependent class constitute the basis of a republican government." End quote. The emerging capitalism marks a global crisis in progress of freedom, or in other words, what promotes capitalism is inimical to the spirit um, of the bourgeois revolution. It is the self-contradiction of bourgeois society. Under Andrew Jackson in the 1830s, the Democratic Party acted to manage society and its crisis for the first time. Executive forces were expanded, more prisons were built, and slavery got its second life. 
the character of the state emerged to change from a facilitator of the people to promote their life, liberty and pursuit of happiness to a manager of crisis, which means an integration of crisis into the state. Jefferson, who is literally the author of the US, was at the end of his lifetime in close contact with utopian socialists. Out of bourgeois society itself comes an anti-slavery ethos. Slavery has, was seen as degradation of free labor and for that undermining bourgeois social relations. The anti-slave movements in the Northern states took place immediately follow, following 1776. The founding fathers were quiet about slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but implicitly a constitution that states the freedom of the individual and the equality of all human beings is in direct contradiction to slavery, which has been the import of a feudal leftover society was tasked to overcome. There have been slave revolts in previous history, but this movement marked the universal liberation struggle of the whole society against the institution of slavery. Nobody is free until everybody is free, is a typical bourgeois thought figure that wasn't born in the 60s. Industrialization divided the rapidly urbanized north from the southern hinterland politically, and the mostly slave-based economy of the south from the mostly wage-labor-based wage economy in the north. The so-called South became a battle slogan, as Marx put it, in a union where free labor and slavery existed side by side and put the unfinished task of the abolition of slavery on the table. The question of slavery became the fateful question of the union. It was the counter-revolution of the American Revolution that brought up the need for justification of slavery. So for the first time, slavery was recognized as an institution good in itself and as foundational for the US. It was under capitalism to implement racist ideologies of, of black inferiority or that only certain races are capable of freedom to justify a standpoint that the constitution does not apply to slaves. The American Civil War was no national affair, even if the isolation of the union let it look like this. The great countries of Europe were no allies with the Union. Instead, they gave great loans to the Confederacy. England almost intervened in the Civil War on behalf of the South to end the blockade of the cotton trade that was initiated by the Union. It was only prevented by the proclamation of emancipation and foremost by the English workers that went on strikes and protested against their own advantage. This gave Marx and Engels reason for the founding of the first international in 1864. Lincoln extended the Civil War to bring the 18th Amendment through Congress, which abolished slavery in invol and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. And the end of the Civil War was, um, the end of the Civil War ushered in the reconstruction phase. The aim was to integrate the remnants of the Confederate secession into the Union and all freed slaves into the system of free labor. The 15th Amendment prohibits denying a citizen the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But the extension of the right to vote was not sufficient for the implementation of equality, let alone liberty. The Civil War was a revolution under the condition of capital and was in that case ambiguous and incomplete in its outcome. So the problem of free labor was manifested ultimately after the war. As Spencer Leonard put it in his lecture, quote, the crucial significance of the second American revolution is as a moment of global unfolding of the crisis of history in the still unfolding revolution of 1848. The civil war marked a world historical event that inherited the legacy of the revolution of 1776, as well as the counter revolution in its global mobilization of conservative forces but it leaves an open question on the problems capitalism brought up as a crisis and potential of freedom.
So I'm going to go through some early examples of how the left has engaged with the ideas of the American Revolution. And so for people like Marx and Engels and through to the Second International and even beyond, both America and the American Revolution represented a significant milestone on the road to socialism that they saw that they were, they believed they were traveling on. And this is particularly the case when one thinks of the American Revolution as not being simply the events from 1765 to 1783, but either as a single revolution or of two revolutions lasting over a century. And the, the American Revolution really ends not with the uh, recognition of American sovereignty, but with the failure of Reconstruction in 1877. And so Marx and Engels recognized this. And in 1864, Marx was tasked by the General Council of the First International to write a letter to Abraham Lincoln congratulating him on his re-election. The letter is worth, worth reading, but it concludes with the, sent with the paragraph, the working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American anti-slavery war will do for the working classes. They consider it an earnest of the epoch to come that it fell to the lot of Abraham Lincoln, the single-minded son of the working class, to lead his country through the matchless struggle for the rescue of an enchained race and the reconstruction of a social world. And it is worth noting that this letter was well received by the American ambassador to the UK at the time who received it. And Lenin likewise recognized the United States has a long revolutionary tradition. In August 1918, he published an open letter to American workers, which includes, the American people have a revolutionary tradition, which has been adopted by the best representatives of the American proletariat, who have repeatedly expressed their complete solidarity with us Bolsheviks. That tradition is the war of liberation against the British in the 18th century and in the civil war of the 19th century. In some respects, if we only take into consideration the destruction of some branches of industry and of the national economy, America in 1870 was behind 1860. But what a pedant, what an idiot would anyone be to deny on these grounds the immense world historic, progressive, and revolutionary significance of the American Civil War of 1863 to 65. And Lenin recognized the significance of the American Civil War as a continuation of the tradition of the American Revolution. The American Revolution was a step towards freedom for all of humanity, not simply for the white American colonists. In the same manner, the American Civil War was a step towards freedom for all humanity, not simply for emancipated slaves. And this, the recognition of the importance of the American Revolution extends beyond simply people like Marx and Lenin. It goes all the way to a somewhat surprising character in the form of Ho Chi Minh, the famous Vietnamese revolutionary leader who, when he made his Declaration of Independence of a Democratic Republic of Vietnam following the Second World War, he began, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the De Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth, all the people have a right to live, to be happy and free. And so even well into the 20th century, uh, so like a kind of third worldist um, revolutionary national self-determination revolutionary like Ho Chi Minh, who went on to fight a war against the United States, recognized the significance of the American Re Revolution. And it wasn't simply Ho Chi Minh, it was like many Vietnamese people recognize this as well. There is a fantastic moment in the Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War, which describes some of the first American soldiers in Vietnam to go into the homes of Vietnamese peasants and find that these Vietnamese peasants had two pictures on their walls. They had a picture of Ho Chi Minh and they had a picture of John F. Kennedy because they recognized, or they believed at least that America's revolutionary tradition of self-determination of human freedom was going to be spread by the presence of American troops and was going to be spread by someone like JFK. That, of course, turned out to be nowhere near the case, but nonetheless, it, I think it demonstrates very well that the American Revolution is a significant thing. It, st it sets out values that remain significant and important even today.
Last month, um, protesters in Portland toppled the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Um, what was self evident for the old left becomes untrue for the so called left today. The Jefferson and Lincoln belong to the struggle for socialism, and so does the American Revolution. The Black Panther Party, for example, was founded with a 10 point bullet program that was a combination of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. The civil rights movement in its founding moment also saw itself as a continuity, um, continuity of the American Revolution. But Stalinism with its liquidation of Marxism and the failure of the new left of the discovery of Marxism and the cultural turn in the late 60s marked an increasing accommodation of failure and regression that haunts us today. It is the shift from a Marxist perspective of post-imperialism to anti-imperialism, as well as post-capitalism to anti-capitalism. Imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, as Lenin understood it, bears itself a potential that points to the global dictatorship of the proletariat and socialism. It would be the task of an emancipatory left to make that potential visible instead of finding itself in a one-sided opposition to it. Let's make that clear on another example. In 1992, the 500 years anniversary of the discovery of the new world by Columbus was protested by the left as the begin be beginning of 500 years of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Whereas Engels approached the discovery as such, quote, citizens. When Christopher Columbus discovered America 350 years ago, he certainly did not think that not only would the then existing society in Europe together with its institutions be done away with through his discovery, but the, dip, but the foundation would be laid for the complete liberation of all nations. And yet it becomes more and more clear that this is indeed the case. The discovery of America was connected with the advent of machinery. And with that, the struggle became necessary, which we are conducting today. The struggle of the property less against the property owners. Thus, through the discovery of America, all society has been divided into two classes. And without the rise of the world market, this would not have happened. The workers of the whole world have everywhere the same interests. Everywhere the different classes dis disappear and the different interests coincide. When therefore a revolution breaks out in one country, it must necessarily affect the other countries. And only now can real liberation take place." End quote. History was seen as an unsolved contradiction between the past and our present that points beyond itself. That means that the accumulation of capital and the discovery of North America could now both lead to universal human emancipation and freedom post-capitalism. Also, last year's 1619 project from the New York Times was a triumph of counter-revolutionary history revisionism. It claims that 1619 is true founding of America, not 1776. This statement was silently withdrawn a couple of weeks ago after a lot of pushback from renowned historians who exposed that this claim was based on lies. It claims that Black Americans have fought alone to make America a democracy, but they were unsuccessful because anti-Black racism runs in the very DNA of this country. The 1619 project is of course connected to the 2020 election and aimed to delegitimize de Trump's presidency. But the left also tailed behind the rejection of 1776 and the, the, the cancel culture campaigns and collapsed into the political support for Joe Biden as lesser evil. But the rejection of 1776 happened before. In 1976, the Spartacist League published on the 200 years anniversary, a why we don't celebrate July 4th pamphlet. It would be the task of an emancipatory left not to erasure the history that failed to fulfill its purpose yet, but to redeem the defeated of the struggle for freedom by fulfilling their unfinished task. But how can a task be fulfilled that was historical concrete for so many years if we forget the history of freedom? 
Without redeeming history, we can only unproductively suppress it and repeat it unconsciously as we do for so many years now. As Chris Cutrone said it in our PR in March this year, the future of socialism, not merely in North America, but in the whole world depends on the fate of the American Revolution. But the left today denies this basic, basic truth. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Evan, um, for this great teaching. Are there any questions? You guys can just unmute yourself. Um, you can also start video if you feel like and or post questions to the chat and we'll take it up from there. I can start. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that was great. Uh, Lisa, you said like this sort of relates to your last point about um, the ways in which the revolution has sort of been suppressed in um, regular sort of leftist discourse. And you made a point um, very early on about how the original American Revolution was about no longer being represented by government. And this, uh, it, it sort of, it's a funny twist of phrase, I think, to describe it because they would talk about tyranny and sort of, if we're gonna talk about the, the emergence of bourgeois culture and liberalism, then I think it's a, it's a different thing than talking about representation in the present moment, or at least it seems like to me. And I wonder if you could maybe go into it. I mean, obviously you did go more into it about uh, wage labor as being contrary to republicanism. And I think this is the issue I'm trying to get at is how, um, how subsequent history changes so that it's not merely a matter of um, republicanism, but it becomes this crisis of democracy and liberalism as such. Um, like as, and it also comes out, sorry, just the last thing, but how the civil war, for example, was not sufficient for equality, much less liberty. So already the, the sort of establishment of bourgeois rights seems to be insufficient. Um, yeah, if you could just talk about that. Yeah, um, this is a this is a great um, uh, point to make um, to to unfold a little bit more, which is the changing character of the state in bourgeois society and how the state itself changed under capitalism. So when when we look at the the bourgeois state and how the state was constituted and this ought to be what, what his task was, was a facilitator and to make sure that the people can fulfill their pursuit of happiness, that liberty and yeah, the, the, the society should move on towards freedom. So it was, the, the development was seen as such as the um, yeah, progress um, of freedom and the state had the task to, um, facilitate this, the general will. When society, and with the, with the beginning of the industrial revolution, society became in self, yeah, into self-contradiction. So the basis of what society was yeah, based on, which is um, their social relations that were constituted through free labor, became inadequate with the upcoming of machines and yeah, so capital. And the state became a new character, the character of managing a crisis, a social crisis that became political in form of the state. So when, um, yeah, in a, in a certain way, the, the state perpetuates as society um, the crisis um, in keeping the uh, bourgeois right to uphold the bourgeois right of the social the the exchange of free labor in society and it it makes society stuck into the progress of freedom um, it keeps them in 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 this bourgeois society while the social relations as such are anachronistic to um, the the development how uh, society is producing uh, right now and so freedom itself is or why um, socialism is, is possible for Marx and Engels right now in capitalism so concrete is because we have the state 
um, of production right now is that we have the machinery is that we have the possibility to go beyond these um, social relations because they are inadequate um, and the state perpetuates this old social relations because it's it's his task to fulfill these bourgeois rights but society itself went beyond this bourgeois right and this is the case why the state is inadequate right now under capitalism if that helps and this is why democracy is also inadequate why why should we uh, participate on a state where um yeah that has this character that is anachronistic to our social transformation um that is yeah stuck or the way that we um yeah the way that we can't fulfill our potential Thanks. Further questions? Uh, one. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, to Lisa, uh, what was that last part? Maybe you can repeat it. I didn't really get it uh, about the, the statement of Chris Coutrone in, in uh, one of the PRs um, about the, uh, the fate of the socialist revolution lies within the, uh, the American revolution. Could you repeat that? Yeah, um, what's interesting, we had a, we had a um, lecture series on the American revolution and at the same time, at a parallel, we had the Kautsky reading group um, this summer. And um, I was following both at the same time, and which is the, the combination of both is that Kautsky is pretty, pretty clear that the socialist revolution would be the fulfillment of the American, Re of the bourgeois revolution and the American revolution is a bourgeois revolution. So it would be the task for Marxism to fulfill this um, promise that bourgeois revolution um, made in, ex in its existence. And as I can, I can re-quote it, um, the future of socialism, not merely in North America, but in the whole world depends on the fate of the American revolution. And it's not only that socialism and the dictatorship of the proletariat is something pretty global, but it's also that we can't think all this without the US. Okay, thanks. So it's more about like uh, acknowledging the task that was set with the beginning of the American Revolution. Okay, thank you. Okay, for people that just joined, um, the presentation is already over and we're for questions now. So everyone who wants to pose a question, you can ask in English as well as in German. Um, we have another question by Wen Tai Shao. She asks, um, great presentation, Lisa. How would you say the German left's attitude toward American Revolution has changed since 2016? Um, well, this is, this is the, the whole problem of the anti-Trumpism, I would say. So, um, yeah, 2016, um, it was the election of Trump and it was seen on the left and, uh, on sides of the Democrats, um, as yeah. Trump as fascist, as sexist, as everything. And I think um, it's not that something changed so much, but it's a deeper crisis that appeared to us 
on side of the left. So the disorientation, the collapse of the left was more concrete um, since 2016. Um, the tailism of the left um, behind the Democrats, behind the, um, yeah, yeah, behind the Democrats politically. And um, I think that the American Revolution as such um, and the, the rejection of the American Revolution has a perversion as anti-Americanism. Um, um, but this is, I would say, this is a development we can see um, since the failure of the new left. And we are repeating everything since then, I would say. All right, thanks. Any further questions? Um, we still have some time left. By the way, for people that just joined this teaching a little later, we will be having another teaching at 3 p.m. on the critique of political economy, which will be held in German. Um, so feel free to join that teaching as well. And if you have any questions right now, just unmute yourself or type it into the chat box. and. Um, I'm sure Lisa and Evan will be happy to answer those. Perhaps one way to sort of bring together um, those two questions that were that were just posed is about how um, in the 1850s. Uh, you see the development um, of both the Republican Party um, in the United States um, and the the Eisenachers um, in 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 Germany, or who are also trying to point towards like the completion of the bourgeois revolution um, after 1848, um, and so the question is really like what has changed within the social relations um, and that like with the the completion of the revolution so to speak like how that itself becomes contradictory and like why Marx is so insistent that that the revolution cannot be quote unquote led or better managed by petty bourgeois democracy so another way of sort of like framing it is like you know, is the revolution just going to be indefinitely managed by the Democrats? Um, you know, in this way, it's like the 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 point of like the 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 purpose of a party sort of like precedes um, the party itself. Um, you know, this is like why the why the you know the 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 Federalist Papers, like the founding documents, like the they're saying, you know, that, that, you know, they have a certain quote unquote ban on factions, you know, like, because it's not just supposed to be like the indefinite um, holding of political power, like a party is supposed to form in order to like, whatever sort of like need within society has emerged, you form a party around that, complete that sort of task within society and then move on and then let society kind of do its own thing. And that like that sort of hit a particular kind of problem um, with the industrial revolution, um, which is of course being like addressed at a social level. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, it, it's a it's a really hot thing, you know, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, um, like Fourierism, Owenitism. Thomas Jefferson is pointing to like this contradiction of you know that that, that y'all laid out great in the teaching about um, how like wage labor is itself a contradiction of liberty. Um, but then like, you know, there would have to be some sort of party that would be adequate to that sort of um, new social contradiction in a way that the, that, the, that the Republican party, you know, couldn't have become, um, you know, even though, you know, they do the industrial, revolution, they, they prosecute the civil war and then try to expand industry. Um, you know, that's basically their point, but that, only you know the the political party of the proletariat um, 
would have been able, you know, it would have been adequate to that, to that sort of new um, social contradiction. So I guess, you know, like in the absence of that, you know, you just have endless Democrat party. And that's, you know, that's precisely what, what Marx is up against with, you know, the failure of revolutions in, in Europe um, is like, you know, it's the petty bourgeois Democrats are, you know, in the name of democracy actually destroying the revolution, the possibility of the revolution. Okay, um, I do have a question as well, unless someone wants to jump on what Clint just said or pose a question, feel free to do that anytime. Uh, maybe for Evan, um, this one. Uh, I just recently watched William F. Buckley's Firing Line, an old episode with Huey Newton, where he basically opens up by asking William F. Buckley and about conservative, on which side would you have been on in the American Revolution, the side of the colonizers or the side of the revolutionaries? Of course, he's probably posing that question from a sort of um, anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist framework, but he just assumes, and I think that's what Lisa also said earlier, right, that the Black Panther Party was founded on a, basically on the Bill of Rights and um, the American Constitution in some sense. Um, how do you explain or at what point and how can we like, I don't know, grasp this historical change? Does radical identity politics as the Black Panther Party in some sense is, how, how, does, how does it come about that this new left politics or identity politics makes this turn against uh, the American Revolution, whereas people like Huey Newton seem to just self-evidently assume that taking part with the revolutionaries in 1776 is the right position to take. So how does this condemning of the American Revolution come about, even in this like branch or strand of, of the left called maybe identity yeah. politics? Well, I guess there's kind of a few things. I think the Black Panthers are kind of the the last, they're almost like a transition point because they have this, like, you know, given their their nature, they have this aspect of identity politics to them, as well as, like, as you're saying, upholding ideas of the American Revolution. Like, I think it was the Black Panthers are also the people who made the Second Amendment into a political issue in the United States, which it has been ever since. Right. Um, and so I think it's probably, it's around that point. I think it's in particularly the emergence of neoliberalism is what really drives it. And because of the left's response to neoliberalism is just to adopt a position of, as Lisa described it, like going for anti-capitalism instead of overcoming capitalism, simply opposing it. And because America is you know, the home of capitalism, of hyper-capitalism, of globalization, of neoliberalism, and is also particularly with the end of the Cold War, like the only, like it is so much bigger and more powerful in every conceivable way than every other country. The, this fact, which, you know, should be or could be used to the advantage of any kind of international project for socialism that, you know, the American empire is so big and so powerful. If you can create socialism in the United States, it will, you can spread it abroad. Um, Instead, because this belief, this focus on rejecting uh, outright these changes, uh, it just simply moves into rejecting the United States as a whole. And I think there's, but yeah, it's an emergence of anti-imperialism and of anti-neoliberalism, and as well the emergence of identity politics outside of the United States, not along sort of demographic lines of say like gender or race, but along kind of senses of national identity. And so like, I'm from Canada originally, and Canada's national identity is simply not being American. And so the left in Canada simply hates everything to do with America and believes that there's no kind of possibility of it being like, redeemed or that there is anything there than simply you know, rich white guys who own slaves didn't want to pay their taxes. And there's a similar kind of pattern in other countries as people try to like assert themselves against, say, American cultural dominance, instead of recognizing, uh, like, America's global hegemony as, you know, not, like, either a good or a bad thing, but as a possibility, uh, it is instead simply rejected in the same way that, you know, capitalism is rejected or opposed outright um, 
because there's no kind of I sense of overcoming it. There's no way that it can be seen as fulfilling it. So things like the Black Panthers, I think, represent a kind of transition point from seeing, um, you know, the need to uphold revolutionary ideas to uh, simply rejecting them. And I think this is also visible in the way that a lot of the left will still uphold the French Revolution, like the fact that Jacobin magazine is a thing and it uses that name and it uses some of that iconography is uh there's a particular kind of anti-americanism for a lot of the left where it you know they don't necessarily reject the board all the border revolutions out of hand but they do reject the american one out of hand because say you know the iraq war which is a slightly convoluted way of of saying yeah it's really just bizarre anti-americanism right it's part of it thanks that's helpful Okay, so if there is no more questions, I would suggest that we wrap up at this point. Um, otherwise, just jump in and interrupt me to pose a question if that's not the case. Um, yeah, so another invitation will have the critique of political economy teaching at 3 p.m. Feel free to join us. And then there's two more events that we're having on Wednesday, uh, one teaching on reform, revolution, resistance, and another one on the issue of Bonapartism and the dictatorship of the proletariat. So it will be the same time, 1230, as well as 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Feel free to join. Um, as there is nobody new here, I think we don't need to talk about our list. No, OK. All right, cool. Thanks for the teaching. Ah, okay, Johannes just corrected me. The Reform Revolution Resistance teaching is at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, okay, cool. Thanks, everyone, and see you at 3 p.m. <laughs>